a pleasure to welcome you to this fourth in a series of lectures on development matters. This series is funded by the Irish Aid, the uh, development arm of the Department of Tourism and Trade in Ireland. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Ireland. We have a wonderful guest speaker with us today, who is Mrs. Fumzile um, Mlabo Nkoka, who is the Executive Director of uh, UN Women. The format of today's event will be about one hour. Uh, it will be a short introduction of 15 to 20 minutes by the Executive Director, followed then by a question and answer session. If you have any questions, you might like to start sending them in during uh, the speaker's address by the uh, mechanism on the Zoom uh, screen there in front of you. Um, this speaker should require no introduction at all. She's had a very distinguished career, including in her native South Africa, where she was vice president for a number of years. She has also been head of executive director of UN Women since 2013. Um, my former colleague, Rory de Barca, will, however, introduce us to her and to the topics that are coming up uh, today. So over to you, Rory. Thanks, Mary. Um, it's good to see you. And uh, thank you, Fumzile. It's, it's fantastic to see you here in Dublin, um, or almost in Dublin, because I know you've been planning to actually be here uh, over the last few months, but clearly for reasons uh, that we, we all understand, uh, travel uh, is, is very difficult and, and your visit will have to wait for another time. So we'll have to uh, see you virtually. Um, and today's discussion is very timely not just because there's an election tomorrow that we're all very much looking forward to and hopefully, and Mary's a veteran of such elections, hopefully Ireland will, uh, will do well, but much, I suppose, much more strategically uh, from your perspective, of course, UN Women celebrates its first 10 years this year. And Ireland has been a very proud partner with you on that journey. And this year too, we mark 25 years since the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Security Resolution 1325, its first on women, peace and security. We've had a few more since uh, 1325. And the hope has been and remains that you know, we can all use these three important anniversaries to build momentum towards the outstanding work of, of gender equality. And that momentum is needed now more than ever. We've had some reminders in the last few months in the context of COVID you know, that the situation of women and girls remains really precarious in, in too many places. Um, and also, we know, and, and you know, that um, the consensus that we thought we had at Beijing is fragile. Not everybody gets behind the, the willingness to, to work hard to achieve gender equality and empower women and girls the way we would want. And, you know, Mary gave, gave some highlights of your career, but from Zilla, you know, we know that the empowerment of women and girls has been a key part of your life story. You know, from your time as the first president of the Natal Organization of Women at Home in South Africa, you know, your work with squatter women in Cape Town, other work, your time as an MP, of course, in South Africa's first free parliament, really, really significant, not just for women, but for everybody in South Africa and beyond. I think people in Ireland took great heart and hope from that change. And of course, you're a minister and deputy minister, deputy president, uh, under Thabo and Beke. So you know what it is to fight for equality and justice, much more maybe than we do. If I could highlight your support for the education of girls, that's really important and, and you've been really helpful to us uh, over the last uh, few months in terms of, of, of helping us amplify the priority which we want to put on girls' education. And I hope too that maybe your early research, you know, on technology as a teacher training aid has been part of the discussion in that because you know, I mean, I think we've seen how, did, how COVID has revealed a digital divide and a technological divide, uh, which is re reducing girls' access to education, particularly now, but not exclusively now. Um, and gender equality is, is a cornerstone of our policy for, for international development, a better world. Maybe that's because, you know, we've learned a lot over the last 50 years here in Ireland about the benefits of gender equality. We, we're not quite there. We have a journey to travel. But I was with my, my daughter at the weekend and we met my mother and it was very clear from their conversation that my, my daughter does not recognise the Ireland that my mother grew up in. You know, when we're married women, 
had to leave work as soon as they got married, where girls weren't allowed to study maths at the highest level, you know, where things like contraception were illegal. So we've traveled a journey. There's more to go. But that empowerment of women has been a big part of our development story here. And I think that informs uh, where, you know, why we wanted to be part of, of our development uh, contribution abroad. So look, we look forward to hearing from you, from Zili, and your quality of, of executive director about UN Women's plans for adopting the Generation Equality Forum, the importance of building a global movement to support building back better on gender equality after COVID-19, you know, those three anniversaries I mentioned and how you want to take that forward. And, you know, to reassure you that Ireland remains and will be a supporter of the Generation Equality Forum and looks forward to working with you and UN Women in leading this global movement to support gender equality, in particular uh, for education for adolescent girls, uh, you know, moving ahead. So look, that's enough, ladies and gentlemen, from Zile Mlabo in Golka. From Zile, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Roaru, uh, Ambassador Whelan, uh, members and friends of the Institute of the Institute for International and European Affairs, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by wishing you and your loved ones good health. And thank you for this opportunity. It is indeed an important year for us at UN Women. Uh, it is a year that uh, we want to try and mark as much as we can, notwithstanding the challenging conditions. We will continue to find ways of marking the 25 years after the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action by making sure that as we move forward, we close the gaps that we have not been able to address effectively in the last 25 years. But now we have to do that in the context of COVID as well. Also, we will mark the 20 years of implementing the Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. But there too, we have to do that within the context of COVID. 19. We also will mark our birthday, our 10th birthday uh, uh, of operating as UN Women. And there too, in our strategic plan, we want to make sure that the lessons learned in the last 10 years make us stronger. COVID-19, like all pandemics, have a gender dimension that requires a gender nuanced response. Women die and suffer in crisis. They also continue to suffer long after the crisis is gone, mainly because of the way the crisis has been handled and the resurfacing and exacerbation of underlying inequalities. The crisis at the same time offers opportunity to build back better, to make sure that the underlying inequalities are addressed in a manner that fixes the problem for the long term. Women and girls are key to building back better because from health to economy, to safety, to burden of care, to underrepresentation in decision making, they are the ones who are bearing the brand, even in this context of COVID. Women have been particularly affected by the unprecedented economic crisis. This is because women disproportionately work in insecure, lower paid, part-time and informal employment with little or no income security and social protection, such as health insurance. Women generally have no saving in most countries because they work in areas where there's informality. And of course, they are therefore unable to look after themselves during rainy days. 
with so many countries under lockdown for protective measures against transmission of the virus, there is another danger that has emerged, which is that of a shadow pandemic of violence against women. We have seen that the women's needs for addressing violence during the crisis cannot be met if women cannot call for help or help cannot come to them. When households are placed under strains that come from money worries and confined living conditions, levels of domestic violence spike. And indeed, we have seen that has happened here. In some countries, the violence, domestic violence in particular, has spiked as high as 30%. Some shelters in some countries that protect and house women who are in a crisis have been taken away in order to use them to isolate patients of the coronavirus. And we have called for governments to declare the services that are needed by women who are affected by violence essential, so that as essential services, they are available all the time as needed. If the global economy enters a recession, as some economists predict, we will be worse off as far as gender-based violence is concerned. It means that there will be a sustained spike of violence against women. And that is why we're calling on all of you to support and to call on all governments to make sure that we intensify our work on ending violence against women and the provision of service with prevention as the first price. Evidence shows that a loss of income for women in an abusive situation makes it it's even harder for them to escape. This risks reversing the limited gains made on women's rights and empowerment, gains that are critical to fulfilling the promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, gains that, gains that are needed in order for us to fulfill the promise that was made in Beijing. One such area which is under threat because of the COVID context is girls' education. With the schools closed for a long time, with many children with no possibilities for online learning, we are seeing a high risk of girls not returning back to school. The school enrollment that we worked so hard for in the last two decades has to be protected. And of course, we also have to make sure that we do everything to support the closing of the digital divide, as well as the gender gap, the digital gender gap that is. And we cannot afford another lost generation. That is why I have to say personally, I truly appreciate the work that Ireland does in girls' education and the focus on digital education. And again, by intervening in this manner, which will help us in the long term, is another way of building back better. We also have to notice that there are women who are affected because of race, because of uh, the, the context of the type of employment they do. Indigenous women, for instance, in Latin America are facing the brunt of the health crisis. Black women in the UK, in the US, are facing the blunt of crisis. So if we deal with intersectionalities, we have to put the issue of race also in the center of our response. We have to make sure that we address these issues uh, together. In some countries, women have been discriminated when it comes to access to services because of their sexuality. This too has to be uh, considered in our response. Three ways that worry us as UN women uh, 
in the way in which COVID affects women. The deepening inequalities, which uh, would reverse many of the gains that we made, the insecure employment, because most women work in the service sector, in tourism, which is both affected by this, they work in hospitality, where contrast tends to be precarious with uh, contracts that cannot be enforceable when stimulus package are being delivered. Those women, together with those who are in the informal sector, fall between the cracks. And then the care crisis. This has been one of the challenges women have always faced. But in the context of this crisis, many countries have their hospitals overburdened. Patients who cannot be taken care of in hospitals end up going home to be taken care of by women and girls increasing the burden of care, which means that women and girls are the shock absorber of the failing health system. And of course, health workers in the health sector are also majority women, and they too have given an excellent support and service to all of us. It is thanks to them that many lives have been saved. But despite that, they are underpaid and they are underrepresented in decision making. So women's leadership is therefore very, very critical in this critical moment. So we're calling on collaboration for governments to make sure that we have minimum standards for COVID, but also for the long term, because all of these challenges that we've seen in COVID were there in the old normal. Uh, exacerbated during COVID will remain for the long term, not unless we commit to building back better and to change to the new normal, which is not the current status quo. We are providing policy briefs to many governments on all of these issues and practical examples. And I am thankful for the support and the collaboration we have had with you because we have been able to support our country offices to work very close with government, from uh, supporting governments to provide policies that respond better to women, uh, from fast tracking the identification of women who are falling between the cracks, from ensuring that uh, we declare essential services as far as GBV is concerned, and looking at working with the ministries of education to make sure that girls go back to school, as well as collecting disaggregated, sex disaggregated data. We look forward to a continued relationship with you and building back better together. Thank you. Thank you very much for that address. And you spoke about a shadow pandemic of violence against women, um, perhaps a shadow pandemic of inequality. Yeah. Are you concerned that in the post-COVID world that the focus will move very much on to rebuilding our economies? And how would you suggest that uh, one ensures that central to that rebuilding of the economies, building back uh, better, that women and girls' issues are to the forefront? Uh, we definitely are concerned that if we do not intervene uh, ahead of time, uh, women and girls will, will disappear in the policies and in the equation. We are therefore uh, engaging with individual governments. Uh, at the same time, we are providing a, a global policy brief where we are pointing at these issues. It's not UN Women who's doing this alone, uh, ILO, UNDP, and of course, other feminist organizations are also there, but we need to make our voices louder. I do not feel that our voices are loud enough at this point, and we need governments who are members of the World Bank, of the IMF, to also engage with those uh, institutions because they are providing significant support to, to governments which need to be purposed in such a way that it addresses women's issues in those countries. It is just too much money 
to be left without intervention that ensures that women are also beneficiaries. And we are there in the field to help them to connect with women, especially women in the informal sector. We know that is not easy, but we do have civil society, we have ourselves and many local actors who are willing to play that role. Thank you. I have a question here from David Joyce, the Equality and International Development Officer of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, and he very much commends what you have said, and especially your reference to Building Back Better. But he draws attention to the ILO uh, Convention on Ending Gender-Based Violence, and he mentions that 190 ratifications are needed for that to enter into force. Um, he wonders what perhaps uh, UN Women can do to ensure there are more ratifications of that convention. Indeed, uh, uh, before COVID, this was one uh, active area for us. We were focused on working together with uh, ILO to get this ratification. In fact, we ended up canceling CSW, as you all know. At CSW, one of the side events was exactly on bringing together the countries that have not rectified in order for us to engage with them and to offer them help. Alas, we could not host CSW. So now as we are regrouping, and thank you for reminding me again, uh, that we need to make sure that we put it in the same package that we're having and uh, uh, pushing to governments uh, in relation to gender-based violence, because we have been so focused on domestic violence actually that I don't think that we have done as much on address uh, the ILO convention. So I promise you, we are going to have that in our basket of interventions. Thank you, thank you for that. A question here from Jackie Fisher from the Ministry of Finance. She wants to know uh, if you think the fact that so many girls and women do invisible unpaid caring for children, elderly and vulnerable groups, that they have been forgotten perhaps in many governments' responses to COVID. And I know that here in Ireland, the issue of childcare is a major issue for those uh, women who are working and trying to homeschool and work and look after their children. Have you anything to say to this issue? Absolutely. Uh, childcare is essential. It is one of, if you like, building back better building block. Because the burden of care has to be recognized, redistributed, and remunerated. And in that process, we also create new jobs for women, and we provide quality care for the children. To have access of affordable childcare in every country, for every family, just like to have water and sanitation in every home, in every school. These are some of the tangible uh, examples of building back better. If we emerge after COVID with a clear plan for providing childcare services, for, for, for providing water and sanitation, for providing uh, schooling facilities that provide online learning for every children, that would show that we have been able to use a silver cloud in despite a, a silver line in this cloud to make lives better and not reverse back to the status quo. A question here from Suzanne from DOCUS. DOCUS is the platform of Irish NGOs. And she says that Irish NGOs had hoped to get fully behind the Generation Equality Forum but realize that things have been delayed. And she asks for your advice as to how Irish society can make its voice heard to bring some urgency to the Beijing 25 asks. Um, and thank you for that uh, uh, question. Yes, uh, we have been uh, delayed, but we have not been canned. So generation equality is still very much on the table. We are now activating the different action coalitions of to address in a very systematic way 
the gaps um, that uh, still remain wide open uh, in the implementation of the Beijing uh, platform. Just to give you an, a, an example, the, the six themes of generation equality are gender-based violence, women's leadership, uh, the environment, uh, SRHR, uh, economic uh, uh, justice, and uh, what's the sixth one? I'll remember. Uh, each one of them is relevant for COVID. In, the, in our response to, to gender-based violence in COVID, we are building now the Action Coalition of Generation Equality. And watch the space. This month, we will be addressing that, and we will be convening to work on identify the critical action under that. Uh, or innovation and technology was the one I forgot. Innovation and technology is a, an action a coalition. It is relevant for COVID. It is also relevant for generation equality and for the, for the long term. So we have identified actions that respond and cross uh, needs the, the, the COVID response and generation equality. And we're taking these together uh, uh, forward. We are grateful that so many of you are still concerned and interested in uh, Beijing uh, 25 and generation equality. That uh, encourages us. And of course, for Ireland, your engagement with young people and education in the context of generation equality is absolutely, absolutely critical. And we have also pulled together uh, the women, peace and security agenda and the development agenda in order to respond to the needs of women who live in conflict and that we are calling a super compact of generation equality. So all of these issues that we are concerned about should be concerned about at this time. We are taking them forward uh, even in this time of COVID. Can I ask you a question about uh, resolution 1325 20 years later? There's mm -hmm. been outstanding work done by many governments in this area, many organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, not least of all, the UN uh, right across the board. Mm. But do you actually see it, that this is making a difference on the ground in conflict situations? Or what more needs to be done? Is it, how does one deal with an issue which essentially you have governments on side, but much of the problem lies not necessarily with governments? Yes. Uh, definitely, there is not more that has to be done, but actually there are problems with governments, just as much as we have with the non-state actors. Because in many countries, a lot of the repression that is faced by women uh, who are human rights defenders comes from government. They are killed by uh, men in uniform. Uh, they are arrested by governments. Uh, many cases the governments that you and I would be concerned about anyway. So governments are as much of a problem when it comes to the repression of women in conflict areas as non-state actors are. But yes, the agenda has advanced. Uh, the Security Council now uh, embraces the role of women. There was a time when uh, the Security Council did not see the relevance of women in, peace, in the peace and security agenda. Now women are regular briefers to the Security Council, but we need the Security Council will to be translated into what happens when they delegate into the front lines. And all governments do not do enough in the manner in which they compose their delegations when they intervene in peace uh, talks. So we don't get enough women coming from the uh, fighting countries and uh, uh, belligerents. And then you have the intervening good governments also not sending women. So they could not be role models even to the people that they are trying to create. So there's something that, that needs to be done that pushes women forward by everybody to, so for women to be if effective participants. There's also the problem of uh, representation of women uh, in the armies, in the security forces, 
in the uh, military police, that is something that is worth fighting for. We have an, a, an intervention which you may know, know about called ELSI, which is led by Canada, which is supporting countries to increase the participation of women uh, in peacekeeping, peacekeeping mission. We need to support that and to talk about. And I wish you good luck in the Security Council because I know you will be able to push this agenda when you are there. And of course, we do not see the allocation of resources to, 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 to women increasing, notwithstanding the commitment. We have not gone above 10% of the resources that are allocated for peace and security work going to women. We are struggling, even within the United Nations, to get more resources allocated to support the initiatives uh, of women. So we need more voices to amplify this message. Thank you uh, for that. Um, two more questions. One is from Carol Baxter in the Department of Justice. And she noticed that, notes that the Department of Justice and Equality in Ireland is undertaking a gender impact assessment of the COVID-19 pandemic and asks what you see as the priorities for action to ensure that policies for recovery help to mitigate gender inequalities. And the second um, question, it is from Nora Owen, uh, and she asks whether the African Union is taking a particular role during the crisis to ensure that gender issues are to the forefront in responses in Africa. So, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for undertaking uh, that uh, analysis. We will be interested uh, to, sh to, to see. Please do share it with us. Uh, and I would say that the areas that need that, that you need to, to, to highlight uh, from, from where you stand, firstly, make sure, obviously, that you get this aggregated data uh, because we just cannot get enough uh, of that. Two, make sure that you look at the, at the medium to long-term interventions that are needed to uh, address gender-based violence for the long haul until we flatten the curve of GBV. And look at, into the fiscal stimulus and their relevance to women and let us see how we could actually help government to deliver to women businesses, women in the informal sectors, women in the industries that are highly affected. And of course, social protection. Let us make sure that social protection speaks to the real needs of, of, of women, uh, of households, and let's make sure that uh, female-headed households also do not feel fall between the cracks. And digitalization, I don't think that we have uh, too much of a problem as far as that is concerned, but please pay attention to the gender gap, especially amongst older women, because uh, all the work that we're doing about uh, closing the digital divide suggested that we still have a digital gap, much higher, obviously, in other parts of the world, uh, maybe not very higher there, but as more women would have to move to automated jobs, you may want to make sure that you, you keep a, a competitive edge for women. Thank you. And of course, health. You know, the representation of, of women in decision making uh, in health, please do an analysis of exactly where are women uh, located in the health sector? Are they making decisions? Are they helping uh, to uh, fashion the responses that also work for women, because it is only when they are in the house, sitting on the table, will they be able to make extensive contributions. And thank you for that. There was also a question from Nora Owen on- Oh, oh yes, yes. Yes, uh, we are uh, working in, in the AU. Uh, for us, uh, we are working on, firstly, we're working on silencing the guns. As you know, uh, SG called for a global ceasefire in the time of COVID. The AU has been working at government level, but ourselves, we and women, we have been working with women, women ministers in all AU countries, especially those where there is a conflict, as well as women's organization. I have been so impressed with the way the women took to heart the issue of silencing the guns. Women in DRC literally going and facing uh, the, uh, the belligerents 
and calling on them to lay down their arms. Women in, in uh, also CAR taking the issue very serious. The uh, ministers of foreign affairs also of, 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 of uh, AU have been working together in a coordinated uh, fashion to facilitate the sharing of lessons and making sure, and this has been the women ministers in particular, uh, the sharing of examples and giving guidelines to make sure that the access to PPE does not discriminate uh, against women. In the economic affairs, there has been an effort to try to position women to be suppliers of PPU, and the AU has asked governments to procure goods from women not to import so that they can keep the businesses of women sustained. Women, uh, some governments have also been buying food from women farmers in order to keep, to keep the women uh, working. And we've been helping them to do this in a coordinated way. In Senegal, for instance, government has been only buying rice, not only maybe, but mostly buying rice from women farmers. And for us as young women who are supporting women farmers, it's been wonderful to see those women staying in business even in the time of COVID. Um, another question uh, here, and uh, slightly different from the questions we've had before, um, so interesting for that reason, from Mabob Plan International Ireland, asking uh, what UN Women is doing on the issue of women and girls with disabilities? Yeah. In, 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 in COVID or generally? Uh, no, generally. Yeah, so we have actually probably two days ago, uh, uh, submitted our uh, policy uh, document, uh, which is trying to mainstream gender in all of the work that the UN is doing on disability. Uh, we have been uh, uh, at least uh, happy that uh, almost all the UN agencies have uh, uh, taken on board the suggestions that we are making but we also have noticed, and this worries us, that within the UN itself, we are not employing a lot of disabled persons because that also is a test, because it means that you have disabled people on the table also influencing uh, the, 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 the policies. At country level, uh, it is very uh, un, un, uneven, uh, the, and our interaction with different uh, governments is also influenced by how much uh, individual governments are able to take the issue seriously. Where we have organizations uh, that are focused on disability rights, our work is made easier because then we combine our efforts together. And where we don't have uh, organizations, it is much harder. And one thing that I would ask of you is please do support disability rights organizations in different countries. Where they exist, they do amazing things, and it is easy to provide support that will be sustainable and homegrown. One country I can think of, for instance, is Zimbabwe, where an NGO that is focused on fighting violence against women has been focused on fighting violence that affects women with disability and is doing phenomenal work. Can I turn to an issue you, you touched on very, very slightly there, the issue of resources. Mm -hmm. um, we all know the, the background to the establishment of, of UN women, but how difficult is it for you to operate in the system where your resources do not match the size of the, of the, the role you're expected to play? I know you have the very strong backing of the Secretary General, but is that enough? Do, do you need more? Huh. Where do you want me to start? I'm going to rent until you, tell, you say stop. It really is a challenge. It really is a challenge. Uh, and uh, to the extent that uh, we have to work across the system and uh, talk, go toe to toe with our colleagues, the smaller we are, uh, the more uh, uh, limited we are in being able to influence. We try very hard to punch above our weight. We also leverage a lot from colleagues in those different organ organizations and institutions of the union because thankfully you do have many gender sensitive people scattered uh, in the UN in different agencies. So we are able to connect with each other. 
but it should not be that we are working almost through the back door in trying to, to deal with an issue that is so much mainstream. To some extent, the issue is in the hands of governments that allocate resources to UN agencies who, who choose to give other agencies more than us. So to the extent that we are mostly dependent on the funds that are given to government just like other UN agencies, and that we are not in front of the queue to the extent that we would hope we would be, uh, this is something that we hope you could help us lobby governments to really help to raise our game. Uh, in particular, core resources that make sure we have a strong organization. Because when we get uh, uh, funds that are so earmarked, it means that you almost do what the funder wants and sometimes not what needs to be done. So it's a very tricky position and you can't afford to irritate your donors too much. So you try to work with them because also they also have their own challenges and imperative in their own countries and their issues that they want to advance and therefore they, they, they invest their money in areas that concern them. 25 years after Beijing, um, the high point, if you like, in, 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 uh, in the last century for women's rights. How disappointed are you where we are? Um, do you see the glass as half full or half empty? I see it as half empty. Uh, uh, disappointment, uh, yes, there is a, there is a disappointment, but, but you know, uh, uh, standing still and not fighting forward is not an option. We definitely have, even now in this time of COVID, see the opportunities we have to raise the bar and to do much, 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 much more work. But one thing that I think that we cannot accept anymore is incremental gains. We actually need to make big, bold steps. When we're talking about women's participation, it has to be parity. You know, away with this 30% issue. We should not be aiming for just, a, just enough or just critical mass. We have to push for the full and the high and the adequately re representation of women uh, uh, everywhere. When it comes into also mobilization, we have to mobilize everybody beyond the usual suspects. I still find that very frustrating that you go into meetings and 80 or more percent of the people who will attend an issue that has to do with women is just women. I think not only is it a big letdown uh, by men, uh, it is also unstrategic for us as women to always sing to the choir and not bring in a much bigger audience of people that we need to convince to fight with us because it is also their responsibility to change the world and to make sure that they serve humanity. And I think this is one thing that I'm asking all of us to pay attention to. We just can't keep on fighting uh, and, 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 and gaining and, and concentrating on the support of just a few. We have to open the tent much wider. Um, there's a question here from Anna Mahani, the International Programme Director from CONCERN. And she asks, if you could make three big changes, what would you focus on? You know, uh, let me say, on GBV, while the emphasis uh, is on uh, ending, uh, on prevention of violence, this is the first price. But actually, violence against women is a crime. To make it a responsibility of the women for gender in most countries is not taking it serious. You are almost treating these criminals who kill women as people who need social service because essentially most uh, uh, ministries that deal with gender deal with social issues. What is social uh, about people who kill and abuse women. I would want all countries to have stronger law enforcement that will make sure that all the criminals who are abusing 
killing and raping women face the might of the law. And I would not make uh, this uh, something that is uh, addressed at a junior level, that it will be a significant issue. Many countries, we had corona is a pandemic. Gender-based violence is a shadow pandemic. The kind of response that we're seeing for corona, we should be seeing uh, on the issues of violence against women and children. So that is one. I would want the political will that is so strong that you really, really raise the bar on fighting violence against women. Secondly, the participation of women in the economies. Uh, and the integration of women in the economy in such a way that uh, the issues of care that limits the women's participation in the economy would all be dealt with together. Many countries, there is no focus on addressing the burden of care and the sustained presence and meaningful presence of women in the economy. And the third issue would be women's leadership overall everywhere, including the leadership of young people, co-generational and shared leadership between women of all ages and in all sectors. I have a longer list, but I'll keep to, to the three. Well, um, I don't want to keep you, uh, I know we, we have to be careful on the time, so maybe we could have maybe one or, or two more questions. Um, but could I ask you, do you have any personal ambition for UN women uh, that you would want to see achieved while you are in office for the, organ for the entity itself? Yes. Well, you know, I, I really would like women, UN women, to be the entity that pulls together within and beyond the women for gender equality in a coordinated way. Because uh, our fragmentation uh, tends to take a lot of resources and time, and we do not get the kind of results that we want. I would like UN Women not to do everything, but to be the one that is a catalyst, a catalyst everywhere in the world for everyone to do their best. I will give you an example. It's my it's, it's example is when we were fighting apartheid in South Africa, the people of South Africa, the African National Congress, which led the struggle, was not everywhere fighting. It mobilized people everywhere in the world to fight for them. Whether it was sports clubs in, 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 uh, in Australia, uh, artists in, 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 in Hollywood, school children in Europe, anti apartheid activists in your own countries, private sector and big corporations with sanctions, people fought the struggle and used whatever tools they had in the place that they were in, which they, which they knew would be effective. The ANC itself did not have to be there all the time, but it has its tentacles everywhere and was catalyzing. I would want UN women to be like that, to be everywhere without being everywhere and to make everybody to be so committed to the agenda that they will use their own creativity, their own knowledge of their own institution to change. You know, we reached a time in the fight against apartheid where the majority of the world was on the right side of this argument. If you were on the wrong side, you were a pariah. So you could not afford to stand tall. Right now, we have leaders in high position and in society who are fighting against women standing tall on the wrong side of the argument. We just have not been able to mobilize enough in a diverse way for this fight to bring in everybody. We, and we, that's why I, I say we need to get out of the comfort zone of the people that think like us, believe in us. We need to go to where people do not agree with us. And these are the people we need to convert. That those are very stirring and, and very well thought out words. Just your final two questions, and we promise we will let you go then, uh, but they're important questions. Uh, Lalini Verasami, the head of IOM Ireland, that's the International Organization for Migration Ireland, thanks you very much for your presentation and would be grateful for your thoughts on the increased vulnerabilities of migrant women. And Dara Moriarty, who is a researcher at the IIAA, 
um, says that you mentioned the issue of race in your uh, um, presentation. And he says systemic racism and police brutality has been to the fore in recent weeks. And are you hopeful that this latest movement in the US, I think he means Black Lives Matter, will have an impact? So yes, on the issue of migrant, I actually, I am quite worried that because uh, most of what I have seen in the response to Corona, I don't feel that uh, the issue of uh, migrants, uh, women and men and children is being addressed adequately. And in fact, Corolla, uh, the response to, to, the, to the fights uh, against Corolla are such that they make migrant persons very vulnerable. If countries are locked down, if people have to social distance, if people cannot walk out, it really uh, 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 impacts on the migrants who's there, because there are people on the move. Their movements are better served when there's freedom of movement. And of course, the risk of being infected if you do not comply. And the access to health services, even when you do not have COVID and you need health services for other needs and you do not have a short self. So there is a lot of work uh, to be done. There's, we have identified that in UN Women as a problem. And, uh, and of course, uh, colleagues uh, in, in our work of uh, working across the UN uh, who are working in, in these areas of migrant uh, uh, have also agreed with us that uh, we actually need to highlight this together. Countries that uh, host many uh, 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 migrants, uh, when they present their stimulus and their uh, social protection measures, we are asking that please provide for migrants as well and have a mechanism to reach them in the situation uh, they are in. And on the issue of race and police uh, brutality, I am hopeful that uh, this could be the moment because, you know, it's important that uh, uh, this uh, moment stays as long as possible because if we, if we stop and start and stop and start, this just continues. It's the same thing with uh, violence against women. We actually need the engagement and the protest to be sustained until there is change, but we also need to define the demands very clearly so that there, there is a definite set of demands that we know we are, we are meeting and we need the time frames and we need the representation of some sort of a Black Lives Matter message that is coherent, that people buy into that is presented. But I also have to say, as institutions everywhere, as governments everywhere, including the UN, including UN Women, we also have to look internally because all organizations have elements uh, of a, a Black Lives Matter of sorts. We also need to interrogate where we are so that uh, this change and the moment that has been brought up by the United States is a moment for all of us to do some, some introspection, introspection. And I have heard people say, please, we, it, is a, it is really exhausting to be discussing about race. It is uncomfortable, but that is where change comes. You will not have change because you are discussing the things that are pleasant to discuss. So, because it is exhausting to be black. So try leaving it to know how exhausting it is. So just talking about it cannot be as, as exhausting. We have to stay with it and fight with it. We have to stay with women and fight for women and do all of it at the same time for the long haul. Thank you very much. And I think if we were in our normal setting, you would get a standing ovation at this point of time. So considered it given. Um, we had a very wide ranging discussion, but then I think we're talking about over 50% of the human race. So of course it should be wide ranging. Yeah. And I thank you so very much. You've given us more than, uh, you've been more than generous with your time. And I think you've also renewed our own commitment. So thank you and the very best of luck with your, with your work. Thank you very much. I truly, truly appreciate the relationship and the friendship that the UN Women and the UN family enjoys with Ireland. Thank you so much.